Welcome to First Baptist Church of Elkin, a community of faith that seeks to love, live, grow, and go like Jesus. Regardless of who you are or where you've been, everyone is welcome, really. If this is your first time with us, we feel honored that you would choose to worship here today. In the pew rack in front of you, you'll find a visitor card. If you're interested in connecting with us and learning more about our church, then please fill out a card and place it in the offering plate when it comes by later in the service. You can also scan the QR code in the right-hand corner of the screen or on the back of your bulletin and fill this out online. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome to our Facebook viewers. Though we wish that you could be with us, we're so thankful that you could join us online. If this is your first time viewing the service, then please let us know in the comment section below. Here are a few things that you need to know this week. Graduation is just around the corner and we will celebrate our graduates in worship on June the 2nd. Anyone graduating this spring is invited to participate. If you would like to recognize a graduate in our June edition of the Herald, then please submit the student's name, family relation, and graduating institution to Lance at fbcelkin at gmail.com. Mother's Day is coming up on May the 12th, and it's time again to beautify our campus with geraniums. If you would like to donate a geranium for $10 in memory or in honor of your mother or another loved one, then please see Lance in the church office. Voce will be hosting their spring concert, Like a River in My Soul, on Monday the 6th at 7 p.m. here at FBC Elkin with guest musician Summit Strings. We hope you can attend. Mission Hearts and Hands will be meeting on Tuesday, May 14th at noon. The luncheon will be at Cedarbrook Country Club. This will be a business meeting, so please make plans to attend an RSVP with Greta Henson by May the 9th. If you have an announcement that needs to be shared in next week's Need to Know, then please email me by Tuesday of this week. God bless and welcome to worship. our heads and we'll pray together. Lord God, there is nothing greater or stronger in this world than the power of love. And we give you praise and honor for not only creating out of love, but for being love itself. Every thought, every decision, every word, every emotion is grounded in who you are as love. And we thank you that your love towards us was so great that you would send your son into this world, not to condemn it, but to redeem it through Christ's death and resurrection. 
God, we pray that as your image bearers, as your hands and feet on this earth, that we too would be defined by love in our words and deeds. Yet we know that we fall terribly short sometimes in our capacity to love well. So we seek your forgiveness, Lord Jesus, for the things that stand in the way of love, jealousy, selfishness, greed, and power. May you grow in us the fruits of a life grounded in love, compassion, selflessness, generosity, and justice. As we gather for this time of worship, we welcome your Holy Spirit in this place to move among us. May everything we offer today bring you glory and honor. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Please join me in the responsive reading. Sing to the Lord a new song, a song of hope and rejoicing. God has remembered God's faithful ones. God has stored blessing upon blessing upon us. Praise the Lord, all the earth. Shout your praise. Rejoice, God is truly with us. Amen. Please stand now if you're able and join us in our call to worship hymn 217, Oh How I Love Jesus, and kids can come down for kids' time. Good morning, and we're missing a couple of kids. Where did they disappear to? (laughs) I often refer to these stained glass windows when I do my children's sermon. But personally, I've always thought we're missing one. In John 13, there's the story of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. And I love that image. 
It should be, uh, well, on this side anyway. We'll, we'll talk about that later when we enlarge the church and put a new stained glass window in. <laughs> when I was growing up, we were not allowed to go barefooted or wear shorts until May 1st. Francis, do you hear that? <laughs> But even on this May 1st, my brother texted all of his sisters that we could now go barefooted. And until I was in the second grade, we did not have a bathtub in our house. We just had like a tin tub or galvanized tub that my mama filled with water and that's, that's how we took a bath. So come around May 1st when we started going barefooted, <laughs> um, We'd come inside and of course our feet would be very dirty. But mama didn't have time to fill up that tin tub every time we needed just to wash our feet. So she'd wash us off, but she always made us wash our feet. You wanna know why? Because all our sheets were white. And if we got in those, into that bed with those white sheets, right. that, <laughs> they would be very, very dirty, wouldn't they? But if you can picture this, now you, you, you see, what Jesus looks like in these pictures, but in your imagination, picture Jesus fully human and he decides that he's gonna wash the feet of his disciples. During the time that Jesus and his disciples were tra traveling around, the climate was dusty and sandy and they wore sandals, so their feet got really dirty. <laughs> And bef before you entered a house, you were supposed to wash your feet. And if that household had servants, then those servants would wash the, the visitor's feet. But a lot of places where Jesus went, they didn't have servants. And so guess what? Jesus had to wash his own feet before he entered the house. But on this particular time, Jesus and his disciples are all together. And Jesus decides that he's gonna wash their feet. Well, they, they didn't like that. They, they thought it was that they weren't worthy for Jesus to wash their feet. But Jesus wanted, and in our, our scripture today, it talks about that Jesus tells them, you are, you are no longer a servant, but you are a friend to me. And I love that. So before they entered the house, there was probably a basin there and a pitcher and they'd pour the water and they'd take their hands and wash their feet and there'd be a towel there and they would dry them. So that's the image that I want you to have in mind. It's pretty, to me, it's very, very touching. The image of Jesus on the cross, that's so powerful to know that Jesus died on that cross for our sins but then I visualized Jesus fully human washing his friend's feet. That human touch. At, at my house, it, since my husband died and I live alone, when Elizabeth comes and spends the night, she always sleeps in my bed. And I, I start out left-handed sleeping and she puts her hand on my shoulder and I take my hand and lay my hand on her. It, it, when she doesn't spend the night, I miss that sweet little hand on my shoulder. The human touch, if you can just, don't you love it when mama or grandma hugs you or they kiss you on the top of the head and tell you that they love you? That human touch. Now today, it might be a handshake. It might be a hug or a kiss. Maybe not even a physical touch, but when you smile at someone, or you say good morning, or even wave at them, that has to be what Jesus wants us to do. Even if we don't go wash somebody's feet, that human touch, even a smile that touches somebody's heart. So, if you will allow me, now I don't have a bucket of water, I don't have a basin or a pitcher. But Elizabeth, would you lift your foot to me? I can't get down. 
and I'm just going to take this wipey, and I want you to live, love, go, and grow like Jesus. <clears throat> Amelia, may I have your foot? Amelia, I hope you live, love, grow, and go like Jesus. Anderson, may I have your foot? You've got on socks, so I'm going to go right here. Anderson, I hope you will live, love, grow, go, and grow, grow and go like Jesus. And now I'll say a short prayer, and you can go back to your seat. Heavenly Father, may these children serve the Lord with gladness. Amen. Thank you for coming down. Please stand now and join us in our hymn of praise. They'll know we are Christians. Please join me in our prayers of the people. Creator God, as we gather in your presence today, grant us the grace to abide in your love, to dwell in the warmth of your embrace, and to extend that love to all those around us. May our hearts be filled with compassion, our words be seasoned with kindness, and our actions be guided by your love. For God's world, we lift up to you the entirety of your creation, for the lands and seas, for the animals and plants, for the intricate ecosystems that sustain life. We pray for your guiding hand to protect and nurture them. May we be good stewards of this precious gift you have given us, caring for it with love and responsibility. Have mercy, O oh God. For our church, we gather as a community of believers, seeking your presence and guidance in all that we do. Bless our church with unity, wisdom, and compassion. Help us to be a beacon of hope and love in our neighborhood and beyond. Strengthen the bonds of fellowship among us that we may support and uplift one another in times of joy 
and sorrow. Have mercy, O God. For our community, Lord of all, we bring before you the diverse tapestry of our community. We pray for healing and reconciliation where there is division and strife. Grant wisdom to our leaders and compassion to all who serve. May we work together for the common good, reaching out in kindness to our neighbors in need. Help us to build a community of peace and justice where all are valued and respected. Have mercy, O God. For loved ones, merciful Savior, we entrust into your loving care all those dear to us. For our families and friends near and far, we ask for your protection and provision. Comfort those who are sick or suffering and bring hope to those who are in despair. Strengthen the bonds of love that unite us and grant us grace to forgive as we have been forgiven. May your presence be a source of strength and peace to all who call upon your name. Have mercy, O God. In the sacred moment, may we be united as one family, bound together by the love that flows from your heart. Empower us to bear fruit that glorifies your name and reflects the love of Christ to the world. And now let us join together in the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Will you join your heart with mine in praying over our offering this morning? O oh God of heaven and earth, how grateful we are together here today to worship you. You have given us access to every good thing because you love us and you instructed us to love one another in that same manner. Out of that love comes our desire to share with others by using our time, energy, and financial resources to care for and support the people, the activities, and the causes that are indicative of the path by which Jesus provided the example. Help us to do so humbly, willingly, and with much joy. Amen.
Our scripture today is from John 15, 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have read from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you as I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the father would give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. These words are a gift from God. Thanks be to God. Can you feel the love today in worship, in the music, in the sweet spirit of fellowship? And a lay leader who washes the feet of our children during the children's sermon, thankful to be in a church that knows what love is. And if we love, then the rest of our mission statement, uh, the living and the growing and the going part, really takes care of itself, doesn't it? Today I want to preach on the subject of the trouble with love. It kind of sounds like a great country music song, doesn't it? In fact, I was sitting in my office, and uh, Lance is usually getting antsy on Thursday afternoon. What's your sermon title? Got to print the program. And I said, The Trouble with Love. And Justin, who is our pop cultural genius on staff, says, That's a Kelly Clarkson song. And I knew it had to be a song somewhere. The trouble with love, I think, is that we often fail to uh, really think about the deep meaning of love. The trouble with love is that love is hard. Love is not easy. Not only that, but I think love will get us in trouble. And nothing will generate any more hate than love. So today I want us to talk about love. We learn in 1 John that, that God is love. Love is God. God is love. But long before you get there, we discover how God is personified by love in the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. Jesus had a lot to say about love, not just loving our friends and family members, but even loving strangers, loving enemies. When we think about biblical love, you probably think about the four types of love, kind of popularized by uh, C.S. Lewis's work in 1960 called The Four Loves, where he isolates and expounds upon the four types of love. And so my sermon now, for just a moment, is going to sound like the wedding homily that you've heard at just about every wedding you've probably been to, but where he identifies romantic or passionate love, that which you might have for your spouse. And there's a kind of love that you might have for your your buddy that you go and play golf with. And then there's the kind of love that you might have for a family member. Uh, Everybody has that crazy uncle, but and you just say, you know, God bless him, Lord help him. He's family. You still love him. And I think these categories are helpful as we think about the various types of affection that we have for other people. But I also think the four quadrants of love can also become safe havens for us because we talk about them so matter-of-factly that we grant ourselves permission to accept friendly love or romantic love or family love as love without acknowledging that even the goal of those relationships are to love everybody as God loves them. C.S. Lewis actually talks about this too, about how these three types of love can become uh, rivals to the chief aim of love, which is agape love. Agape love is that which Jesus is speaking about in today's text. It is the kind of love that God has for us. It's the kind of love that we're called to reciprocate in our relationship with other people. And so in today's text, we pick up where we left off last week with Jesus sharing in that final meal with the disciples, offering them what has come to be known as 
the farewell discourse. Jesus has just said that I am the vine, the true vine, and you, all of you, are the branches. Thus, Jesus is the life source that enables us to grow towards the light and to overcome the weeds and the dead branches that stun our growth and prevent us from developing as God's people. I believe in this chapter, John calls upon us to consider the divine flow of love itself. And love flows from the life source to the branches, from Jesus the Christ to each and every one of us. Thus, if we're going to bear the fruits of love, that is the end goal, then we have to know who God is in Christ. We have to know what God's love is like before we can be fruitful, fruitful, and before we can bear witness to the love of God in the vineyard of this world. So what is God's love like? This agape love is an active kind of love as opposed to just words that we may say, I love you. God didn't just speak, I love you, from the clouds, but rather God came to live among us. This gospel says that for God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten son. So love gives. Not only does love give, but love gives freely and love gives indiscriminately. You know, I think we all have a tendency to try and to put limits on love. Consider the number of times that you may have said or that you may have heard the words, I love you, but... The trouble with love is that we're loving people, if we're loving people the way that God loves them, then love can never be followed with the word, but. When I was in Naval Chaplain School, I, and he's now one of my dearest friends, uh, John Nip, who's doing great things in the active duty world, I noticed that he was a master communicator. He hardly ever used the word but. Uh, We would be having a deep theological conversation late in the night, and he would say something like, "Uh, yes, well, I agree with you, and here's another way to look at that particular passage, where I would have said, well, John, I agree with you, but... And then I would notice in the classroom the same thing. It was always, that's a really good point. And, and he hardly ever used the word but, and he and I had some rich conversation about that, and, and he helped me. I learned a lot from him because, as most of you know, the term but actually negates everything that you say before it, right? So if you say to someone, I agree with you, but, what you're really saying is I don't agree with you at all. And maybe I say that sometimes, and what I should say to you is I just don't agree with you at all. Some of you are looking at your spouse and shaking your head. Yeah. You see, let me pause and say that tough love, which is probably more often than not when you've used this phrase, I love you, but, tough love is a very real thing. Sometimes tough love is the loving thing to do. But don't be surprised if the recipient of those words, I love you, if they simply hear even though you're not trying to say this, but don't be surprised if what they hear is, I don't love you. But what if you say to that wayward child or that person in your family that you're struggling to love, what if you say something to the effect of, not, I love you, but you're not going to do those things under my roof. But I love you, and because I love you, you're not going to do those things under my roof. And... I know that God has plans for you, that God has hopes for you, that God wants to see you excel in every single way. Can you imagine a world where God says, I love you, but? Think about that for a moment. You see, love is not a rebuttal. That love is not a a, a stop sign, but love is a bridge builder. Love is not defensive, but when we read about love in the Bible, love always goes on the offensive. And Paul writes, of course, in that great hymn to love, that, that love always takes the initiative. Specifically, love bears things, believes things, hopes things, endures things. Love is not passive, but love is active. Paul writes that love keeps no record of wrong. Someone once said that when we get angry, we don't get hysterical, but we get historical. It's not I love you, but you remember that time. That's not it. When we say I love you, but we have drawn a hard line in the sand And we've constructed a wall in the sand of love. When we say I love you and we're building a bridge that always keeps the door open for life to improve. So the divine flow of love that starts with Christ the vine stays on the offensive, moving toward us. And in this text we discover, not only that, but we discover that, that God is the one who chooses us. And I think that's an important thing to focus on today because 
This text removes the cherry picker from those of us who want to decide who God loves and who God does not love. So everything about love, we might say today, begins where? It begins with God. Christ is the vine from which love itself flows freely. To each of us who are the branches and the recipients of God's love. So then we might say that if we are the branches, then we are the first obstacle that prevents love from bearing fruit in the world. You see, love is always in competition with this entity that we call self. And you've often heard it said that you cannot love others until you have properly and appropriately loved yourself. You know, this self-love is very important, isn't it? We all bear the uniqueness and beauty of our Creator, but as human beings, we have all made mistakes. I would imagine that all of you have done something that would make you and prompt you to not want to love yourself. And sometimes that resentment when we fail to love ourselves appropriately can simply be projected on to others. You know, we all grew up hearing the words, hate the sin and love the sinner. Have you ever heard that before? It's not bad advice, actually. But how often do we apply that language to ourselves? Think about that for a moment. Hate my own sins, but love myself, because I am beautifully and wonderfully made. Because God sees my potential. Because God sees our value. God doesn't just see our mistakes. What is it that we love about ourselves? We don't love who and what society tells us that we need to be. We don't love our sins, but rather we love who God has created us to be. We love what and who God is shaping us to be as God prunes us, as last week's text shares. We, we love who God desires for us to be, despite the many ways that we may have stunted spiritual growth in our lives. And we should see ourselves as, as sinners, but we see ourselves as sinners who are overcome by the grace of God. I met a rabbi in Newport, Rhode Island last year, a brilliant Navy chaplain who survived the Beirut bombing, absolutely fascinating human being, Jewish rabbi. But despite the pain that he saw in that moment, and despite all the pain that he saw in the world, he said these words, and maybe he got it somewhere else, I don't know, but I couldn't, couldn't find another quote, so I'm giving it to him. He writes and said, if we cannot see the face of God in others... Let us at least see their face as human as our own. When we acknowledge our own humanity, then we begin to see other folks just as human as we are, as a people who need the love of God and who deserve the love of God just as much as we do. But when we fail to see ourselves as God sees us, as sinners who are overwhelmed by God's love and grace, then the divine flow of love very easily just stops with us. And the flow of love will never bear fruit for our neighbors. So today I would say to you that the divine flow of love all starts with God. It starts with Jesus, and it flows to those of us whom God has chosen. We are all the mighty branches of love, entangled with all kinds of non-fruit-producing vines that are striving for the light of God. And I think this is what makes love so hard. Now elsewhere, you see, Jesus challenges us to love our enemies and, you know, forgive 70 times 7 and turn the other cheek and all that stuff. And that's, and that's all hard enough. But, but in this text, we, we don't find the disciples being encouraged or summoned to go out into the world and do all of those things. But here, Jesus calls the disciples first and foremost to love those people who are closest to them. I think that's even harder, isn't it? Because we can love our enemies from a distance. But those folks that we encounter on a fairly regular basis that we're called to love. Robert Beerley says this so well. John takes up the challenge of loving those near at hand. Perhaps those in the pew right beside us. Perhaps those in the church next door. Sometimes it is the most difficult task to love those that we have known the longest. And those who have we have gone to church with the longest. I have found in my own life that that Christians have become the most difficult people for me to love. And it struck me when I wrote that down for the first time that it's probably just because I've spent most of my time with Christians, which also says something about how I need to reinvent myself as a minister. But oftentimes, the reason that I struggle with Christians is because I struggle with how they're missing the mark. 
I struggle with their inability to practice what they preach or because they advocate for things that are simply hurtful to people that I love and care about. I'm also self-aware enough that I know they probably say a lot of the same things about me. But despite the good that folks want to do in the world, sometimes I struggle to love them. And I want to spend just a moment reflecting on people who have been hurt by the church who are hurt by oppressive systems often perpetuated by the church throughout history, and folks who are held down by some very twisted theological interpretations of the Bible. You see, Jesus loved everyone, but he had a particular heart for the poor and the marginalized and those impacted by demons, as the New Testament says, and and people who were stuck, I think, in all kinds of oppressive and abusive situations, often held down by all kinds of systemic injustice. Jesus was not afraid to speak lovingly but also to speak prophetically. And then Jesus embodied that love. And God calls us to speak lovingly and prophetically with our hands and our feet and with also our mouths. Not only that, but the trouble with love is that sometimes the people that you want to love are the people that you simply cannot love without bringing harm to yourself and your community or another generation of of people. That is, to love them closely and deeply. And if you love who God created you to be, then you will not continually subject yourself to all kinds of emotional and verbal and physical abuse. And so this call to take up your cross in the Gospels is is not a call for anyone to accept evil in the world. And I pause and share this because I know that there are lots and lots of people who scroll and who listen to us online and many of you that come from all kinds of situations and just like that. And love doesn't call you to remain in that kind of a situation, but rather love calls you to abide in Christ. And when we're abiding in Christ's love, then love has the capacity, I think, to get us into what we'll talk about today as as good trouble. Because when we acknowledge that love is not passive, but it is active, then love calls us to stand up and do something, maybe about our own plight, but certainly also about the plight of others. When it is clear to us that things in the world are just not right We have to advocate as the church for people who have been crucified by all of the many crosses in our world. John Lewis may have become a very well-known politician, but long before that, he was called at the age of 15 and is remembered for his understanding of good trouble, a sentiment that MLK, of course, echoed. And I'll tell you, I'm very careful about which politicians that I praise. But long before he was a politician, again, he was a preacher, And I don't think love goes around picking fights with people, and he didn't either. And love is not a a chip or a political chip that someone wears on their their shoulder. Of course, contrary to popular opinion, there's as much hate among Democrats and Republicans and independents alike. But I loved John Lewis because he was a fellow preacher. And I heard him preach in Georgia at a Baptist assembly, and he's right. He said that the church should not be afraid to get into trouble so long as it's good trouble. Because the roots of good trouble is not in the civil rights movement in American society. And the roots of good trouble are not in the Protestant Reformation. But you see, the roots of good trouble run even deeper in the history of time to an era when God came to live among us in Jesus Christ who got into all kinds of trouble. But it was all good trouble, wasn't it? In our chapter for the morning, Jesus goes on to tell the disciples that the world hates you because the world hates me. And you see, that is the trouble with love. As I said earlier, nothing will generate hate any more in the world than love. And my definition for good trouble is when we when we wake up people and systems and movements that are just trapped in all kinds of darkness. It's kind of like, have any of you ever been awakened in the middle of the night when you're in a deep, deep sleep? You're sleeping so great and it's Your alarm is set for 5.30, and at 4.15, the telemarketer calls from overseas somewhere. And you wake up, and you're like a disoriented zombie. And you hopefully don't say anything too rude before you hang up the phone. And then you just get mad when you finally come to your senses, and you're just mad. You're mad because you were awakened, and you have to deal with it. But then you have to make a decision. Am I going to just get up and take a shower? And get on with God's new day for me? Or am I just going to lay there and toss and turn and be all mad because they woke me up? You see, that's what good trouble does. 
Good trouble wakes us up with the light of God's love. Good trouble snaps us out of the illusion that we are following Jesus when in reality we are hardly following Jesus as we walk through all kinds of darkness or the nostalgia and complacency of the past. But when we're connected to the vine of Christ, we are destined to get into some kind of, of good trouble that bears fruit. I'm convinced that the church in America has simply not remained connected to the vine of Christ. And if it has, it is just hanging on by a thread. Russell Moore has said that, that we sit in our pews or behind our pulpits knowing that our children watch Christian cartoons. We vote for the right candidates, the Christian candidates, and know all the right worldview talking points. But so often the talking points are our talking points rather than Jesus' talking points. And we're content with the world that we know, just adjusted a little bit for our identity as Christians. And he also writes, and I think this is so true, that the Bible Belt is collapsing, that the world of nominal cultural Christianity that took the American dream and added Jesus to it in order to say that you can have everything you ever wanted in heaven too, is soon to be gone. Good riddance. He writes, good riddance indeed. You know, when I was called to ministry many years ago, I was really gung-ho about all this moral majority kind of stuff. And as I grow, what I discovered is much of that has left us with nothing but a moral minority and rotten grapes. And what I have learned in my ministry is that love is usually not in the majority at all. Love is usually in the minority and all of that was never really about morals. It may have started out that way, but it was really all about power. And then we had this rise of, 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 um, of Christian nationalism in our society today, which is really not Christian at all. It's just nationalism, and it's really a craving for power. And it's so unhealthy. It's not patriotism either. It's really all about power. And there are so many people who are, who are stuck in, in this cultural Christianity just barely hanging on to the vine of Christ by a thread. I'm thankful to be in a congregation full of people who have the eyes to see this and who want to model a different way in the world. And it is the dissenting way. It is the way of love. But you know, even though, and this is the hope that we find in Easter, is that even though our culture seems to be moving in this very unhealthy direction. The good news of the gospel, and I think the real trouble with love, is that the love of God always refuses to let go of us. We can run from the love of God, and we can pervert the love of God, but it always chases us down. We can hide from the love of God, but it always finds us. You can make up your mind about something, but the light of God's love will change it. The Holy Spirit and the love of God are pursuing our rotten society today with love. And you see, that's what happened on Holy Week. The disciples ran away from the love of God in Jesus Christ, and they left their Lord in the shadow of Gethsemane. And Peter denied Jesus three times, didn't even know him. And by the time Jesus got to Golgotha, there was only a few women and the beloved disciples who remained. You know, we often say at Easter that Jesus got up from the grave. Actually, the synoptics say that God raised Jesus from the dead, but in the Gospel of John, it says that Jesus got up from the grave. We might say today, for the sake of this text, that, that it was love that was crucified on the cross. And we might say that it was love that got up out of the grave. Love got up from the grave and marched all over Jerusalem and Galilee, gathering those who had abandoned God's love the disciples who had fled down an Emmaus road, others who were hid behind locked doors. You see, both the trouble and also the blessing of God's love is that there is nothing in all of life that can separate us from the God of love. The message of Easter is that not even a cross, when we nail Jesus to a cross, can separate us in the world from God's love. So my challenge for you today is don't ever stop thinking deeply about love. Don't ever accept a casual definition for what it means to love God and to love your neighbor. Despite your sin and your failures in your own life, may you know today that God loves you unconditionally and that, and that when we remain connected to the vine of Christ, then we are destined to bear fruit. Embrace the love today that God has for all people and work hard not to say those words. And I know it's easy to do it. I love you, but... 
May we always be an I love you and kind of people. Embrace the mission of love in the world, especially when it seems that love is getting you into trouble. And you will always be the kind of congregation where your lay people come down on the front row and wash the beautiful feet of your children. But wash the feet of one another as well. Strangers, enemies, friends, crazy uncle alike. And keep encouraging me as your pastor by staying connected to the vine even when love, when agape love is hard. I was meeting with a fellow this week and we were, we were talking about some, some complex issues. We were talking about some pretty complex folks. And he said, I may not understand him, pastor, but I know that my job is to love him. You know, when I hear this kind of language, even though I know that we may not have clarity on all things, we may not have clarity on every issue that there is out there for us to talk about, we may not have clarity on every difficult person out there in the world that we deal with, but when I hear people talking like that, I know that the fruit is on the way. And I know that because the divine flow of love has not been interrupted. And that is a choice that we make as the branches who are connected to the vine of Christ, who is our Lord. So as we prepare our hearts now to sing our hymn of response, and as we celebrate today the fruit of the vine, uh, the, uh, the, the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine, the love, the elements, the grace and mercy of God personified in these ordinary elements. As we prepare to celebrate that for each of you that want to for this first Sunday communion, I invite all of you, choose love today, even when you don't understand, even when it's hard, even if it gets you in trouble. Just make sure that whatever trouble it gets you into, make sure that it's good trouble, that it's trouble that is connected to the vine of Christ. Because good trouble always bears fruit in the end. In fact, we might even say in this season of Easter tide that sometimes good trouble spells Easter, doesn't it? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As Lance comes to lead us in our hymn of response, Today, if you feel so compelled and want to celebrate the Lord's Supper, here at First Baptist, um, all people are welcome to celebrate the Lord's Supper. If you have a prayer need, the altar is open for you to come and pray. If there are things that you need to share with me to pray about, I'll receive those uh, at the table. If there are new commitments that you need to make and you want to make public today, this is the time when we formally offer you that opportunity. May you stand, may you sing together, and may you come forward after I offer the words of institution over the elements as the Holy Spirit leads. M210.
Amen. We thank you today for your presence in this time of worship here at First Baptist. How can we look forward to speaking with all of you outside in just a moment? If you're a first-time guest, look forward to meeting you and learning a bit about your story. May we all stand for the benediction. <clears throat> As we do, I want to let you know, um, uh, next November, uh, the children's ministry will be growing by one child. And uh, Katie and Anderson and Lee and I are excited to uh, announce that the two of them will be a big brother and a big sister. And we are, could not be any more excited about that and, uh, and couldn't be any more excited to be raising our family uh, in such a beautiful and unique and loving community of faith. And we look forward to sharing and the joy that is to come uh, in so many ways, um, but especially in the joy of, of parenthood as our family continues, continues to grow. So, all right, let's bow and receive this benediction. So now may the broad expanse of God's love and the abundance of God's grace fill your hearts and minds this week, giving you strength to live as Jesus lived and to love as Jesus loved and to unite as one church in every way. May we go now bound together by a common hunger to proclaim the radical welcome and embody the radical love and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Amen.